friends and welcome back to the Kiss Cast, a podcast where I talk about my love for Grand Admiral Thrawn and all of his friends, Chiss or not Chiss. Just decided to call it Chiss Cast because, you know, it's a cool name for the podcast mostly centered around Chiss. So today we're going to do a book review. And I know that I w- I said this was gonna be like a bi-weekly podcast and then I, I was gone for hmm, for uh, like uh, three months or something. <laughs> I was just like very not um, excited to edit a podcast because because those are you know those, those take a while but i am back because i just i feel like i need to get my thoughts on chaos rising in a more coherent format than just continuously tweeting about it anyway so chaos rising came out on september 1st which was my birthday and it was arguably one of the coolest birthdays i've had you know not just because like You know, in general, it was a really nice birthday day, but also I just spent the majority of it listening to Chaos Rising, and it was amazing. And so, um, the book was, uh, this time it pretty much, like, it aligned with my expectations pretty well, and I know I hadn't done enough podcast episodes, um, you know, when we got all the excerpts and stuff like that, like... Uh, We got, like, what, four and a half excerpts uh, within, you know, the month before release. And I didn't talk about any of them, except, like, screaming on Twitter. So, I, you know, it pretty much matched my expectations. Um, However, the book was a mixed bag uh, for many, many reasons. (laughs) There were parts of the book that made me uncomfortable... But there were also parts of the book that I cannot stop thinking about because I will cherish them forever. So, where do we start? Where do we even start with that? The first excerpt that we got was a prologue. Um, And of course, the prologue started with the attack on Scylla. I refuse to call it Chila. Nope, that's not happening. And I'm not calling it Chaplar either. That's not happening. Sorry, not sorry. I learned to pronounce Eli... Because I listened to the book, um, uh, to Throne 2017, like, six times, uh, you know, over at this point. But <laughs> I'm not saying Chila and Chaplar, no, that's just not, nope, nope. So, uh, the attack on Sila, uh, and uh, we got introduced to General Bakif, who most of Chis Twitter immediately pinpointed as Dad TM. And I'm... <laughs> I'm glad that that actually, you know, we we predicted correctly. Baki was very much dad TM to both Thrawn and Aralani. Speaking of Aralani, she was the star of the show, really. And um, uh, what was it? I think it was the um, Thrawn 2017 uh, Star Wars Show Book Club episode where Timothy Zahn said that Aralani is his favorite chess character. And I, like, I can tell from this book, I can really tell that she's his favorite. He he gave her the name Ziara. Her full name is Irizi Aralani. And so her core name is Ziara. And, like, y- just from that name, you know, compared to most other chess names, you can tell that this guy really likes Aralani. So... She was really the star of the show in this book. And I know that in all previous books, like, we were like, oh, Aralani is such a mom to throw on. In this, she felt like more like an annoyed big sister. <laughs> and their relationship is so cute. It's so cute and so fun. They actually joke with each other like have we have we ever seen Thrawn joke before and he genuinely jokes with Aralani in at least one uh, on at least one occasion so that that was really sweet like I don't ship them in a romantic way but I don't begrudge people who do so because it would be a cute ship not gonna lie um another thing that a lot of us were actually afraid of is that like uh, the excerpt of Thrawn and Thalia's meeting for the first time. It was like, are they gonna make it a weird thing? And the most that, you know, that you could read out of their relationship was, like, Thalia's... I, I want to say Thalia's, honestly. You know, is that is that allowed? Is that acceptable? Uh, Thalia's has sort of a crush on Thrawn 
that's sort of like a, you know, she admires him. I read that more as like she admires him. Um, and like, I, I'm glad that it wasn't like explicitly supposed to be like, ooh, romantic. Because I don't know if you know my opinion on uh, Luke and Mara's relationship, or rather the way that Zon wrote Luke and Mara's relationship. I, I don't like that, and I don't think that he's very good at it. <laughs> I, I think he's much better at writing, like, these very, like, strong, intense friendships, like, with Ron and Eli, um, and, you know, it, it turns out to seem more like a romance than the actual romances that, that he wrote, but, you know, that's just my humble opinion. <laughs> um, so, I feel like what I prefer in most of my um, fiction that I consume is... Uh, character relationships and dy dynamics over plot. Like, the plot can be shit, but if there's a strong character dynamic, I will latch onto it. So that's why, I feel like that's why I started um, talking about the relationships between char characters, because to me, that's, that's, it's just my favorite thing about any sort of media. Like, if, if a piece has a good plot, like, I will appreciate it, but I will not have any long-term attachment to it because there's no, like, strong character dynamics. And, and in this, I feel like there was, even though it's, it would not be comparable to some other Thrawn books, I feel like. Um, so, Vakif, I feel like, is one of my favorite characters from this book. Um, along with Wutro O and Shiri... And who was who was the other? Like, I feel like it was Bucky. Oh, also Samacro. <laughs> Samacro was so funny. He's so grumpy. God bless. <laughs> he is. He is just. He's just a grumpy, a grumpy dude. And I, I, I appreciate him a lot. Uh, I feel like he's a, he's a really fun character. Surfian, who I now mockingly call Turfian. <laughs> was such an ass, and I feel like he's, of course he's annoying, but he wasn't as annoying as General Yiv, the benevolent, oh my god, can we talk about General Yiv, and how um, he was, like, supposed to be cool, like a cool villain or something, but he was so annoying, he was so annoying, oh my god, I can't, I don't know if it was actually the audiobook voice, um, I feel like for the first time, Listening to an audiobook uh, versus reading the uh, the ebook actually uh, made so my impressions, like first impressions on characters, worse than just reading the book w would have done because so the voices, like Mark Thompson, is an amazing voice actor and he really does the most when it comes to giving characters distinct voices, you know, and when there's so many characters in one book, it's pure dedication to do so many different voices. So, like, I'm not uh, shitting on Mark Thompson's narration skills, but I feel like some of the characters' voices, like, for example, Kilori's voice and Yves' voice, they were just so annoying. I feel like if I hadn't listened to the audiobook, I would have enjoyed these characters maybe a little bit more, because I wouldn't have to listen to the voices. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think... I, I want to read the ebook, but it's like... <laughs> it's so hard to read something that you already listened through, and there are some parts that you don't want to revisit. Um, speaking of these parts that I don't want to revisit, um, I feel like a one thing that is a good thing has also, you know, it backfires a little bit. And that good thing is that Zon is um, putting more and more female characters in his books that have, like, main roles, which is really cool. I think he said in a panel or an interview or something that uh, Del Rey and Lucasfilm always uh, encourage him and push for more female characters in, like, leading roles or, like, supporting roles. Just, like, you know, more female characters in general. But then, in this book specifically, and this is, like, this is not a spoiler-free review. This is not a spoiler-free review. <laughs> My apologies, I forgot to mention that. I, I feel like I could have done 
a spoiler free review, but we've gone we've come this far. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, um in this book specifically, like the whole hostage situation with Thalias and later with Thalias and Chiri. Uh, Chiri is also a name that I would have pronounced Chiri, like more like, you know, French. But uh, the, uh, the narrator pronounced it Chiri, and that was, you know, it stuck with me. You know, that's what happens when you listen to 15 hours of an audiobook. <laughs> so the hostage situation really rubbed me the wrong way. It really genuinely made me uncomfortable. And uh, that's some parts of the book that I genuinely don't want to revisit at all. Just a dynamic. It's like I know that um, Thrawn, you know, Thrawn knew that they were gonna be all right, like, you know, and they trusted Thrawn. It's like cool, but also like the dynamic. Reading this, reading that was uncomfortable, you know, and uh, yeah, that's that's my take on uh, Thalias and Shiri being uh, <laughs> literal hostages. Um, my favorite parts of the book, however, besides the memories, the memories, oh my god, okay, first of all, the memories was the best idea um, that, that, <laughs> that Zon had about this book. I feel like it was such a good idea because Zon said that we wouldn't see Kid Thrawn in this book, like he's, he's a little bit older, it's still young Thrawn, uh, but, he w- but we wouldn't see like Kid Thrawn. And the fact that there were those, like, memory bits, and especially that first one, where Thrawn was, like, like, what, like, he was, like, like a 15 or 16-year-old with his, with his cute, soft voice. He was so precious. I can't, I smile and want to cry every single time I remember it. Like, when I listened to that first bit of memories, which I think went immediately after the prologue, and baby Thrawn saying, already? That was the cutest thing ever, oh my god. If you follow me on Twitter, you already saw me draw that moment because it stuck with me. It stuck with me because I could I could imagine, I could see it in my mind's eye, those big red glowing eyes and like, already? That was so cute. So, I really love the memories, and also, what was that other memory? Oh yeah, Thrawn, also around the same age, um, uh, meeting Thalias, which I feel like he was, he was the cutest. Also, speaking of that, that's, that single memory, um, in that memory, um, the ship's captain, I forgot her name, but the ship's captain basically does this exercise with Thrawn where she spins him around a bunch and asks him to point to where uh, the front of the ship is. And he does it first try. And she's so baffled because it took her, like, what, 14? 14 voyages to do that. And he did it on his first voyage. And Mr. Zahn said... Multiple times a Thrawn is in no way force sensitive. I call bullshit. I call bullshit. There is no way that you can like like how? How? And 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 with the addition, once again, major spoiler alert, uh with the addition of the fact that Thrawn had a sister who was a Skywalker, the and you know that I feel like, you know, because the force is strong in my family, etc. etc. I feel like that force sensitivity rubbed off a little on Thrawn. Like, don't don't at me on that. I firmly believe this. <laughs> I firmly believe this. I will not take. I will not take any other, you know, facts, TM, or whatever. So, Thrawn is just a little teeny tiny bit force sensitive in my mind. Like he's he's not you know strong in the force enough to be like to have like Jedi skills or whatever. But I feel like he has a little bit of that sensitivity to the force that gives him that intuition to feel the ship, to feel where um, where the front of the ship is, you know, on his first voyage, to have that connection with Earth. Oh my god, there was a quote. Wait, let, let, me, let me find that in my thread. Because I made a live tweet thread. If you haven't seen it, well, you probably had me muted because I tweeted on it on release day. <laughs> 
So um, there was one moment where Thrawn was like, I can't explain it. It's just a feeling I have when it comes to uh, his art analysis. Like, And that just reminded me of the quote, it's an instinct, a feeling. I think it was a Finn quote, and I really like that quote. So I feel like he does have that little bit of force sensitivity because a lot of the... Mm, I don't know what uh, whether it was legends or or canon. The fact that you know not everyone. I think it was actually from legends that like there are people who are force sensitive, not enough to be Jedi, but just enough to have a little bit of that, a little bit more intuition than the average person. So you know, and and if we follow the whole midichlorians thing, you know, if you have like an average amount of midichlorians that's not, like, Jedi level, Jedi levels of midichlorians, but, like, also not zero, you know, you have that extra bit of intuition. So, you know, I feel like Thrawn has that. Thrawn is that, that much force sensitive. So why don't we go actually through my thread and see what I tweeted about when I was really excited about Chaos Rising. <laughs> it was so funny when, like... Uh, before the book, I feel like somebody else tweeted about this, before the book where we were all like, oh my god, the Miss family, you know, it's so sexy to be in the Miss family, because, because, uh, you know, for all this time, the only characters that we knew from the Miss family were Thrawn and Thras, and those were some of the coolest characters ever, <laughs> and I tweeted, my dick gets hard at any mention of the Miss family, like, at the start of the book, and then we got uh, Thurfian, I, 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 that asshole, we'll just call him Turfian. <laughs> and, and I feel like after, after him, and after the fact that the myth, most of the myth literally just don't care about Thrawn or hate him, I'm like, no, these people have no rights. <laughs> also the fact that officers and warriors are apparently two distinctive, uh, occupations. <laughs> Like, uh, you know, I thought that Chiss were, like, you know, like, if you were in the military, you were considered a warrior, but, like, apparently there's officers, and then also there's warriors. So I'm waiting on an explanation for that, actually, I think. Maybe we should ask, like, Delray about that. <laughs> I feel like with all these, like, lore questions, it's like, do we ask about it now, or do we wait until all three books are finished? <laughs> because, like, I know that some things are gonna get answered, and some things are just gonna not get answered, and you ha you have no way of knowing which, which ones it's gonna be. Also how, in the first memories bit, there was the sentence, Vuron was no more, in his place stood Thrawn. That's such a trans rights sentence. <laughs> I love that. I love that that food for all of us trans throne warriors. <laughs> In general, like the whole mystery of like who was the person that like got uh got thrown approved into the myth so fast and then Thalia's meeting with the patriarch. That was one of my favorite one of my absolute favorite parts of the book, like top three favorite parts of the book. Also, a good thing about the audiobook was that, uh, basically, whenever they do Star Wars audiobooks, if you never listen to one, they do all the, like, ship ambient noises and, like, um, in general, a lot of ambient noise, uh, um, you know, depending on the place where the action takes place. So, a lot of the speeder and ship noises, like, ambient sounds, were made different because this is just ascendancy. And the book itself started with a long time ago beyond the galaxy far, far away, which I think was the coolest touch. Ah, yes, Thrawn said, a feeling that forms in my mind. So it's a feeling. He just feels things. He himself can't even explain his um, art analysis, like how he does it. He just does it. It's an instinct, a feeling. It's the Force TM! <laughs> Oh, also, let's take a moment of silence to mourn. Syndic Mithrasaphis. Thank you, my heart is broken. It is shattered, and I can only hope that we will see him in future memories. I'm just surprised that we didn't see him in any of the memories in this book, 
because um, as we basically, as, as it was hinted, TM, in that um, uh, Q&A that they did uh, on September 4th, that uh, Zon wants to make as many of his Legends books as he can, like, woven into the new canon, even if they're not explicitly canon. Um, so, like, if Thras is still Thrawn's brother, then why wasn't he in any of Thrawn's memories? Did he just, like, vanish and one day reappear as a syndic? <laughs> I, I want to know, and I hope we will find out, because if, if not, I will show up at Zon's door at 3 in the morning and demand answers. <laughs> Also, the fact that Thrawn's career in the Empire was so much smoother than his career in the Chiss Ascendancy is so funny to me. Because, like, you would think that he would have a harder time among aliens. And, like, he did have a hard time, you know? It wasn't, it wasn't an easy road, but, like, he didn't get his ship taken away twice. Or more, like we know of of two times where he got his ship taken away. But what about all the times that we don't know about? So I feel like, you know, like in the Empire, Thrawn 2017 in general, like one of the main uh, themes was like struggling, you know, uh, with xenophobia and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and, this, and this book is just like, hi, you thought that was bad? Look at how bad it was with his own people. Also, Sherry was one of the best characters in this book. And I feel like um, uh, one of my mutuals on Twitter asked Del Rey, like, ages ago, uh, what was their favorite character. Like, can you give us the first initial, um, or, or like, the letter, the first letter of their name, um, you know, of your new favorite character from Chaos Rising? And they just wrote, like, they replied with the letter C, and I have a feeling they had uh, Sherry in mind, because she is definitely one of the highlights of the book. She genuinely has, like, one, one of the few characters who actually has a character arc in the book, and she is the cutest little thing. She is so cute and sweet, and I'm so glad that she has... Um, she has Thalias now, who was a navigator and who understands her. That is so important. And also Thrawn being dad. Can we talk about Thrawn being dad? Because, like, he was, like, I, like, I tweeted on Twitter, uh, the fact that Thrawn was away with her for five weeks means that for five weeks he made her food, he put her to bed, he probably read her bedtime stories, he had to calm her when she had nightmares, he taught her how to fly, he encouraged her art, and just that, that throne, that throne is everything that I ever needed. Like, one of the highlights of this book was that little bit of throne being so gentle and kind and soft with her and, and teaching her to fly and just figuring out that she wants to learn how to fly and, and helping her conquer her fears and, you know, the, the whole nightmare thing. Ugh. God, it was it was beautiful. Like this book was a mixed bag. There were some places that where it was like kind of eh, and there were some places where I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. So you know, uh, and also this was the first book in a trilogy. So you know, compared to how I felt about Heir to the Empire, compared to this, or how I felt about A Spectre of the Past, compared to this, I feel like this is a lot better of a first trilogy book, uh, first installment of a trilogy than uh, the previous two. I know that uh, that um, Spectre of the Past is a part of a duology, but Zahn said on multiple occasions that it was supposed to be, like, it was, it, it's a trilogy condensed into, into two books. So I feel like with the fact that this is only the first book, it was a pretty good book, you know, for a first book. Because I feel like while Heir to the Empire uh, and Spectre of the Past were pretty cool, they were kind of slow, you know? Uh, and I'm sure that by book three I will be breezing through it. Well, you know, to be fair, I, I didn't listen to this in two days. But by book three, it'll be like so fast-paced and so exciting that I have high hopes 
TM for that. Speaking of High Hopes, I feel like that song was in the throng playlist, which we also got, which was so cool. I need to go back and listen to that playlist now that I read the whole book because um, because I feel like I will get more of the references. I feel like, especially some of the songs, like the You're Gonna Go Far Kid one, like that, that is a very clear reference. But yeah, let's let's get back on track. Thalia's calling Thrawn one of the best warriors. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> Even though he's a dumbass. Also, <laughs> the nut paste thing. And nut paste sandwiches. <laughs> the fact that out of this entire book, at all of the new chis lore that we got, nut paste sandwiches being the thing that people are talking about the most <laughs> is so funny. <laughs> Like, Zon took the time and care to put all these, like, you know, just lore details about about adoption, about uh, family politics, you know, even, like, the family homesteads and stuff like that. And all we care about is the fucking nut-based sandwiches. <laughs> so, yeah, more, more mundane details like that. We love mundane details. Like, you know, how, la how we latched on to the fact that Eli Vanto's favorite popped out flavor is strawberry. I will never forget that. That was a highlight. That was a highlight, just in general. Also, somebody in the book pointed out that perhaps is a politically accepted neutral <laughs> response. And I'm like, if Thrawn learned anything about politics, is the perhaps. But then, then we got a supremely just better explanation for the word perhaps in the in in the panel on Friday. Zon said that Thrawn uses the word perhaps to be encouraging, to encourage the person to think more along that train of thought, to develop that and see where it gets them. And the fact that Thrawn is just so patient of a teacher and he wants to encourage people to think and and explore um, the you know like explore their thoughts, explore explore paths. It's just, you know, this this is why we love Thrawn. He's just the best. Also, Wutra O was probably my favorite side character in this book. The, <laughs> the fact that, like, pretty much her introduction was her beefing with uh, Syndix when she and Aralani went to basically get court-martialed because Thrawn was not, you know, Thrawn was absent. The, the just that introduction, like she's so feisty. She's she's not like other chesty. I'm like the other chest seems so stoic compared to her. And she's like, she 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 has she's not having any of their bullshit. And I loved her instantly. And whenever she was, uh, whenever she spoke in the book, I was delighted. I was absolutely delighted. Also, Mark Thompson gave her kind of a an English a British accent. Um, <laughs> and I think I think that was adorable. So I really love Ultra O. And also, can we talk about how navigators are really treated like that in the Chase Ascendancy? Like we suspected that. Um, well, at least we had canon that. Like you know, probably they're not like it's not a head canon. It's just more like an observation. Like if you take kids, like you know, pretty much toddlers from their families. Well, not toddlers. I feel like they were they are taken when they're like uh, five because Thrawn's sister was taken when she was five. Um, <laughs> if you take children from their families and force them to do like actual work for many hours and many days up until they're like 14... That that's not a really good thing, you know, and it, it just made it worse. The fact that these kids, these 14-year-olds, or however, you know, whenever their uh, third sight, I wanted to say, expired. <laughs> ah, yes, my powers have expired. <laughs> when, you know, when your third sight fades, the fact that they are not returned to their birth families, what the fuck is going on? Also, as, uh, uh, as my friend pointed out, the fact that Thrawn just, there, it seemed that he didn't really care that he was being separated from his birth family and adopted into the myth. He was like, just, all right, 
Also, the fact that he was so concerned about his classes, Thurfian was taking him to, like, an interview or whatever. And Thor was like, but, 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 but my classes. <laughs> it was so cute. Okay, I'm having, so, I'm having so much fun talking about this book. I feel like I had a lot of mixed feelings while reading this book, but, like, talking about it is so much fun. Oh, also, Kilori of Wa- Yuan Dualan. You want du- you want Dolan? <laughs> I forgot how to pronounce that. <laughs> That's that character was probably the the most bland and annoying character. No, Thalias was was also bland, but um, <laughs> Kilori was was a very bland, like morally gray character or whatever. Like, yeah, you're working for both sides, and that doesn't make you interesting. He's just like that that annoying pawn. Uh, character that just like sucks up to the evil guy and his only personality trait is that he sucks up to the evil guy for whatever reason it's like no that's not compelling i'm sorry <laughs> so yeah speaking about uh bland characters i feel like we need to talk about the fact that for a main character Thalius was very bland like, she didn't really have any personality except for being an ex-Skywalker um, and liking Thrawn, which... <laughs> who am I to judge? I mean, when my only personality trait is liking Thrawn. Okay, okay, maybe maybe that's a little hypocritical of me. <laughs> okay, but for real, like, she didn't really have any, like, interesting, nothing really interesting about her, except, like, the trauma TM of being an ex-Skywalker, which wasn't really even explored that much, you know, like, by that time, she's 20-something years old, and I feel like she's, she's, like, 20, 21, you know, a little, just a little tad younger than Thrawn, um, I feel like there's, like, a three-year difference between them, three, four-year difference, um, (laughs) so... So she, you know, like, I I feel like maybe she just kind of got over it, but then, you know, it's it's so easy to be like, he's back on a military ship and she has, like, you know, PTSD flashbacks to being a Skywalker or whatever, because you can tell me that being a Skywalker doesn't give you some sort of PTSD. Like, it's literally said that they continue to have nightmares afterwards, and... The fact that all Skywalkers, well, most Skywalkers, want to fade into obscurity after their service also says a lot. But no, we didn't see any of those repercussions. Okay, then. Timothy. So, you know, <laughs> like I said, this book is a mixed bag. Also, oh my god, the part where Sherry was playing with the Skywalker on Lani's ship was the cutest thing ever. Oh my god. Like literally, the baby Skywalkers were was were, were the best part of this book. Also, the fact that some caretakers that ass yell at Skywalkers is like, "Who gave you this job? You need to be fired." These children literally serve the Ascendancy. Like they're 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 sacrificing their entire childhoods, their fucking development to to fly your stupid ships. Give some respect. Oh, also the art museum bit. <laughs> That was that was certainly something. Like we all freaked out. Oh no, are they gonna be a romantic thing? And by the end of the book, it's like I hope Zon doesn't make it like explicit. Well, he did say that he didn't see it as a date, so thank fucking god. But like, you know, like I said, if people ship Zon and Lani, I don't, I don't care. You know, it's fine. But the fact that they went to the, like Thrawn to Lani to an art museum and described it as like a night of excitement and discovery it's so cute and i think that that was like the one or maybe maybe one of the two times where we saw thrawn stutter i don't think that we'd ever seen thrawn stutter before ever and this was this was a historical event tm also the sparring bit was so cool sparring bit especially the sound effects in it the music that was really really cool one of the coolest bits in the audiobook also the fact that Lani was so out of breath and Thrawn was not that's another thing that you can only tell when you're listening to the audiobook and and those little details make it worth it me tweeting i hope the new cartoon are going to be sexy and they weren't 
sad. I feel like I feel like General Yiv was like a sort of a a mix between maybe it's because like uh it was General Yiv the benevolent uh but he kind of his vibe kind of reminded me of Grievous which is like more funny than scary or sexy so <laughs> like no offense to my mutuals who find Grievous sexy y'all are valid but in general I feel like like Yiv was like a mix between Grievous and Nuso Eswa and a bad mix at that and whatever villains they're gonna come up with in the in the coming books. I hope they're gonna be sexier, God, please, 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 Timothy. I know you're capable of writing sexy villains because Thrawn was one and Nuso Eswa was one, please. Also Vagari. The Vagari, I know that they're like defeated TM in this book, uh, but the way that he wrote the Vagari in Survivor's Quest was so chilling. They were genuinely terrifying. Like, I know that you're capable of this, Timothy. Please give us villains like that that are either so scary that we get chills or so sexy that we get chills. <laughs> or both, you know. Both, like, a, you know, it's a mix of both is also really good. Also, when Thrawn gave Thalias a gun, <laughs> she was like, who, 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 What do you mean I'm gonna have to shoot people? <laughs> that was so funny. Also, the origins of the Chimera symbol. We finally have that. It's a little bit less cool than I would have liked, but it's still hella cool. That is like, I, I think he, he was like, I, I'm gonna keep this in a place of honor or something like that. And boy, did he do that. Boy, did he do that. I love that. Okay, the one thing that I did like about Kilori was him calling the Force the Great Presence. One of, one of the things that I love in Star Wars is all the different names that different civilizations have for the Force. Like, the fact that Chiss called it Third Sight, you know, Kilori calls it the, the Great Presence. Um, I think in uh, Legends of Luke Skywalker, uh, it was called the Tide. I think that was that was a really a really nice name for it too. So I, I love all the different names for the force because they're all so beautiful. They're all so beautiful and poetic and make me feel nice things. So yeah. Also <laughs> the fact that Thrawn is actually a good pilot <laughs> just stomped on our Thrawn can't drive head cannon so hard. <laughs> and I'm kinda mad, but also, you know, Thrawn piloting like a single starfighter or a smaller ship, like him actually piloting is so cool and sexy. You know what? I'm not even gonna complain. <laughs> I tweeted, throw on your alien king is showing. <laughs> I think this was in, in, in revelation to him uh, hiring Kilori. <laughs> also me tweeting that a drinking game, you know, a good drinking game for any Thrawn book, especially in the new canon, is taking a shot every single time somebody says combat or combat readiness <laughs> because Ron is like get get the ship to full combat readiness and there's always someone in the crew who's like combat what do you mean combat are you expecting combat <laughs> combat in my chest ascendancy it's more likely than you think also i don't remember the context of this but Thrawn saying which are enemies and which are friends. And Bucky having to correct him to which are enemies and which are neutral. The fact that Thrawn saying that, you know, enemies and friends, it just is so cute. Help, this man is so cute. I am in love with a war criminal. Oh my god, also Arlani saying to Thrawn, there's your canvas, paint me something. That's was a line that hit me hard in the face. Like, that... Wow. That, I, I don't even ho know how to describe it. But it gives me a feeling, TM. You know, it makes me feel things. Also, when Thrawn jumped two ranks instead of one, and my immediate thought was, Eli Parallels! Eli Parallels! One of my mutuals also made a very good tweet about how there are so many parallels in Thrawn's and Eli's careers, how basically they both 
you know, were as obscure as it gets, and then somebody noticed their potential for brilliance and basically plucked them out of obscurity and, you know, g gave them the opportunity for their skills to truly shine. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Mr. Timothy Zahn is gonna make up for a good day, Lieutenant Vanto, by paralleling their whole lives. That's some soulmate shit right there. <laughs> so the fact that Aralani and Bucky are talking about Thrawn as if he was their problem child <laughs> was so funny. Like, this entire book is just Thrawn and all of his babysitters. Oh my god, at one point he literally <laughs> referred to it as babysitting. And it was so funny, <laughs> because he's not wrong, and at least he's self-aware. <laughs> also, Thrawn snorting and actually, like, smiling and laughing and having emotions, that was a refreshing TM. <laughs> also, Thrawn saying, I disagree, and then correcting himself to say, I respectfully disagree. At least I think it was Thrawn, I don't remember, I'm just reading my tweets kind of out of context. <laughs> okay, so the family hostage thing was so funny at first, because <laughs> when Thrawn started explaining it, I was like, what? Oh my god, that's terrifying. And then he was like, ha, I made it all up. And I was laughing so hard, but then it actually got, you know, really uncomfortable when he actually went through with that plan, so, you know... It's not not my favorite thing about this book, definitely. Like, Thrawn making Thalia wear the makeup, it's like, okay, she agreed to the mission, right? And it's like, it makes sense story-wise, but like, the, like, the vibe, the vibe is rancid, my friends. The vibe was rancid, and I did not like that at all. Like, who cares if there was like, a tactical advantage, like that, you know, whole secret thing with the gas at the end, and that was, you know, made it no less creepy, you know, kind of even more creepy, if you ask me, so, not a fan of that, <laughs> so, Thrawn's love for going undercover, I, I'm glad that it extends into this, uh, in, into, into new canon as well, because I haven't finished Side Trip yet, but, you know, I feel like Thrawn had a lot of fun in that Boba, Boba Fett cosplay, and now he's cosplaying an interstellar art expert. <laughs> also, Thrawn actually wearing traditional chess robes. I would kill to see what that looks like. You know, the fact that we still don't have uh, a canon illustration of what chess robes, you know, not, not military chess clothing looks like, is a crime. I hope they give us that soon. So, you know, sooner rather than later. Okay, another favorite bit from that book was when Thrawn was like, I can beat them right now, Ziara. That, I feel like if you didn't listen to the audiobook, you didn't get the full effect TM. That was another one of those bits that's definitely worth getting the audiobook for, because that was the most emotion that I've ever heard in Thrawn's voice. Well, except for, you know, Thras in Legends. <laughs> When he exclaimed Thras, that was that was adorable. But like in New Canon, you know, nar narrated by Mark Thompson, I feel like that was the most emotion that I've heard from Thrawn. This urgency, this frustration, that was that was a whole new level. I loved that part so much when he was trying to convince Aralani to to you know to allow him to defeat. Uh, the pirates, or the, they weren't really pirates, were they, they were, um, li 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 <laughs> that was, uh, <laughs> that's another word that I know how to pronounce because of the audiobook, but I don't know how, how it's written. <laughs> okay, the one redeeming quality of General Yev was that he had some tentacle pets, uh, on his back. <laughs> I feel like that's a really cool thing for a villain to have. Okay, so let's talk about the throne had a sister, thing, plot twist. Um, I feel like, first of all, it feels unfair to Thras that, like, like, why not, uh, do the emotional thing, TM? Like, th this was probably the most, supposed to be the most emotional thing of the book. Um, uh, <laughs> 
why not do it for Thras? Like, you know, about Thras's death or something like that. Why do you have to invent a whole new character that we don't even care about just for Thrawn to feel some sort of pain about, you know? Like, I feel like Thras, at least he knew Thras, you know, for the majority of his life or whatever. And then the sister, he, he, how, you know, it's like when you're three years old, because it was established that um, Thrawn was three years old when his sister was taken, you know, into service. When you're three years old and, and like, if you've known someone until you were three years old, you didn't really know them. You maybe have vague memories of them, but you don't really know them, you know? <laughs> so, like, why is this supposed to be, like, the, the angstiest Thrawn moment of the book? Why is it supposed to have this big emotional impact when we neither knew this sister and neither did Thrawn, really? Like, I, I, I don't understand. Like, it's intriguing, sure, and I, I, I am sure that, like, because this was dropped in such a way, it will be revisited, and it's likely that by book three, um, by by the end of book three, Thrawn will reunite with his long lost sister or whatever. But uh, oh my god, what if the female character that you were talking about in the Q and A is gonna be Thrawn's sister? Huh? Interesting. Interesting. So. <laughs> I I am both intrigued and annoyed at this because it really depends on how how Mr. Zong will handle this because it could go either really like heart wrenching and really beautiful or it could be just like very poorly done you know it could go either way I feel like also the fact that Ron is actually called a threat to the ascendancy and a menace is <laughs> so cool to me like it's it's hilarious but also it's like my boy is that powerful he's that bitch he is that bitch <laughs> we love to see it oh my god also another favorite bit from the book was the saplar mystery and in general the Cecilia mystery the fact that the city is empty is just saying that it gives me chills those kind of eerie bits in books, I feel like, are some of my favorites because, you know, something that you thought was a given, something that you thought you knew, and they, it turns out that you didn't know anything about it at all, that it's all a lie, and it's so wild to me, like, that was one of the coolest bits of the book. Also, the Myth Homestead, I feel like we'll get to that, but the Myth Homestead was another another amazing part of the book. One of the strongest parts of the book. Uh, even though, like, after, you know, when it switched to that, I was like, oh, no, I wanted more of Thrawn and uh, Thrawn and Shiri uh, scouting. But by the time that uh, chapter ended, <laughs> by the time that chapter ended, I was like, this is incredible, amazing, I love it. Also, the implication that Thrawn is not from Scylla. Wow, like... So many of our head cannons were just thrown out the window with that. Because a lot of the fandom was like, oh, you know, Thrawn probably really loves uh, uh, ice planets and stuff like that because he feels nostalgic. He is really good in low temperatures because, you know, he grew up on Scylla, so he must be used to the cold and stuff like that. And there were so many fix where um, Thrawn... Uh, actually returns to Scylla or Thrawn uh, lives with Eli on Scylla. Just there's, you know, maybe it's because it was the only, and I, I feel like in, on Wikipedia it was said that Thrawn was from Scylla. So like, I don't blame us for assuming that. It's just like so much of that is now thrown out the window. And so these headcanons were so dear to me. But hey, I am don't I don't mind Thrawn being from like a forest planet or a tropical planet. What if Thrawn is actually from a tropical planet? Imagine that. Thrawn like on a fucking surfboard. Yeah, I would like to see that. With a flower crown? Yes, definitely. Also Lani inviting Thrawn to stay in her homestead was so cute. Also another thing that I noted in my thread was that I like the fact that this book wasn't nearly as stressful as Treason was. Maybe, once again, because Treason's marketing was a little bit misleading. 
We all thought that something really, 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 really fucking bad was gonna happen. Some of us thought that Eli was gonna die. So, like, the entire book, I was dreading. I was like, what if Eli dies? What if he dies? What if he dies? Oh my god, what if Thrawn is, like, forced to kill him or something? And then nothing of that sort happened. <laughs> and and here it's like, you know, the, the knowledge that it's the first book of a trilogy, so nothing too dramatic is gonna happen. Also, the knowledge that, like, Thrawn's not gonna die or anything because it's a prequel to his whole fucking story. You know, it was a, it was a pretty chill ride, you know, up to the end. I feel like there were some intense bits at the end, but, like, you know, nothing too dramatic. Also, the fact that the Reza tried to recruit Thrawn, and he would be named... <laughs> he would be named Zeron. <laughs> not gonna lie, that's not the worst thing to be named. <laughs> I feel like if, if he was a part of any other ruling family like so, that would sound really funny. Also, I feel like, you know, because I didn't make any episodes since, like, May... <laughs> You didn't hear me scream about Vuron being his birth name because I have been waiting for that information for so long because I feel like we got teased that his birth name was different back in mm, I don't know like a long a long time ago almost a year ago <laughs> and we were all like so eager to find out and, and finally finding that out was like ecstatic <laughs> also the fact that Multiple times in this book, you know, somebody's explaining something about politics to Thrawn. And he's like, I see. And people definitely know that he doesn't understand it. That was so funny. You know, it's, it's kind of endearing that Thrawn is so clueless when it comes to politics. And he's like, oh, I'll study this, this strange art of politics. And Lani, in her head, is just like, I know this man is never gonna learn anything about it. You know, there's just some things that you're not good at, and that's okay. You know, we still love you, Thrawn. You may commit war crimes, but only minor ones. <laughs> okay, I don't know who it was, but somebody in the book called you competent and charismatic. And I was like, where? Bitch, where? Also, the fact that there was only one May Warrior's fortune smile on your efforts uh, in this whole book was very disappointing to me. <laughs> also, Shiri being so afraid to ask for more uh, markers and Thrawn being like, oh, I bought you two sets and some paper. That was the cutest shit ever. <laughs> that Thrawn is the best. Okay, now let's talk about the fact that this literally overlaps with the bit of alliances where Thrawn met up with Anakin, and it actually has Thrawn talking to Duja, which, you know, is something that I never thought that I would want, but that was hella cool. That was really fucking cool. Also, the whole exchange between Thrawn and Anakin from Thrawn's point of view, and Shiri laughing at Anakin mispronouncing Thrawn's name was the cutest thing ever. Also, like, I still want to beat Thrawn's ass for making this nine-year-old, like, leaving her in charge of his ship while he went to the surface to fuck around with Anakin. For like a solid week or something, like what the fuck? She's literally nine! Thrawn, with all due respect, what the fuck? Also the fact that Thrawn downplayed his rank so he wouldn't intimidate Anakin is so funny. Like, I, I, I don't know anything about military rank, except that Admiral is like, Grand Admiral is like the highest Navy rank. And, like, Ensign is the lowest rank, and everything between that is, like, so confusing to me. So, like, I, 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 I would have no idea if they didn't point that out within the book. That Thrawn downplayed his rank, but that fight is so funny because, of course, Anakin would feel, like, intimidated. And Thrawn, you know, Thrawn has strategic reasons, TM. Also, we now know that uh, the armor that Thrawn was wearing in Alliances is the Chiss Combat uniform, which is, you know, makes makes sense. There's nothing new there, but, like, the official, I don't know, just something about the combat uniform sounds so sexy to me, you know? <laughs> oh my god, okay, let's talk about the Patriarch. That was one of my favorite 
favorite, favorite, favorite bits of this book in general. The whole myth homestead, the trials, uh, the first bit with the ascendancy map and the green glow as uh, as Thalias walked across it. That was that was some of the most beautiful shit. And then the mountain and the patriarch. The patriarch was so nice. And Mark Thompson did such a nice job. And the patriarch in general sounded so nice and wise. You know, it's one of those uh, elder characters who are like, very kind and very wise and that, that you just want to get hugged by, you know, and told that everything's gonna be alright. <laughs> I don't know, there's there was so much warmth radiating from that part. That was that was like arguably the most heart that this book had. So uh I really loved it. I really loved it. And the fact that the patriarch was the one uh who chose Thrawn. That was that was so cool, you know. And the fact that there's probably like when when that patriarch dies, you know, some uh, some you know some asshole is gonna take his place. It's it's so sad because because he 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 really seemed like a like a nice guy. Also, wait, oh my god, I forgot that Bakif was myth. Like I I think that I heard that right. I <laughs> I listened to it twice when I was listening to the book just to make sure. Uh, and I think that the patriarch said that Bakiv was a myth before he became a senior officer. Also, I tweeted the Stalin, Thurfi, and hate fuck when <laughs> because they're always together <laughs> trying to fuck up Thrawn's life. It's like y'all take a break, chill for a moment, have a drink. Also, the fact that uh, Shiri was described as being more confident and grown up when she came back from the trip with Thrawn is so sweet. It's like, yes, he's best dad. <laughs> I don't know what it was in reference to, but Lani was saying that that something is illegal and insane, and Thrawn is just like, agreed. <laughs> he knows. He knows what he's doing. He fully knows. He's like, the sign can't stop me because I can't read. <laughs> also, Thrawn saying, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> was so funny. Like, there are some things that Thrawn says in this book that, like, older Thrawn would never say, and it's hilarious. <laughs> also, the fact that, like, okay, Thrawn, Thrawn sending Thalias and Shiri on a mission is bad enough. But then Thalias being the one to freak out when she's literally in space, alone, with a nine-year-old. Like, excuse me? <laughs> Poor Shiri, she's gonna need, like, therapy or something. I, I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to pay for it, because I know that she's sentency will not provide it for her, so I'll pay for it. I promise. Oh my god, this part that fucked me up was Aralania Thrawn being xenophobic to aliens. It's like... Aralani is like, oh, for the first time, I see other aliens as people. And Thrawn is like, okay, I don't. <laughs> no, no, that that was just that was just bad. I don't fucking care. Like, <laughs> okay, they they had character development later, but still, that was, you know, you can you can do this to any other chess. I don't care, but not to our faves. Not to our faves. No, I will not allow it. Also, Thrawn's entire plan about that last mission being, you know, oh no, General, you have stole a Skywalker. It's like, yeah, it worked, but it was a shit plan because the kid is ten. Okay, nine and three quarters, as she said herself. <laughs> okay, one of the hardest things that Thrawn said in this book was, then come and take me. That's sexy. That's decidedly sexy. Thank you, Tim. Also, Thrawn seeing no witnesses, implying that he's gonna kill everybody on that bridge, that was so sexy. Like, you know, Thrawn is a dumbass baby sometimes, but sometimes you get reminded how fucking ruthless he can be, and that is so hot. Oh yeah, also them offering him the position of trialborn, when they should have demoted him, definitely. It's like, this book is so confusing. Thrawn does a good thing. It's like, oh no, you did a bad thing. And then Thrawn actually, you know, endangers a Skywalker and, like, you know, basically traumatizes two women <laughs> by making them be hostages to, like, the most evil guy around. 
and everybody's like, ah, you're promoted! Oh yeah, one of the last things that Thrawn says in that book is where I see nonches as assets. And it took me, like, a whole day to recover from that. Like, no, that is not my man. That is not my man. That is not the man who was simping for Anakin so hard. And for Padme, you know, for that matter. Like, y y you can't tell me that he wasn't simping for Anakin when 20 years later he was literally pining and being sad and emo about the fact that Anakin Skywalker is dead. Like, come on. Be consistent, at the very least, or at the very most, acknowledge the fact that Thrawn was simping for humans way before he said this. You know, not even talking about Cardass, because, like, if Timothy says that he wants to um, imply that, you know, as many of his Legends books as possible are still, you know, compatible with canon, then that implies that Cardass was a thing, too. And Cardass was literally the first friend that Thrawn made you know, that the whole thing at the end of, of, of Outbound Flight was the fact that Thrawn considered Cardass a friend. Like, you, you can't be this inconsistent. Like, okay, make Thrawn be racist, but, like, at least be consistent about it and, like, make, you know, make that before all of those things happen, you know? So, I was really annoyed at that. But also, I was just heartbroken because it's like, no, no, that's my baby, that's my comfort character, you can't do this to me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there was uh, a lot in this book. The ending of the book with the villain was, you know, like, with a new villain, what it, what, what was it, Jixtus? Um, it was intriguing, but only mildly. Like, if this is just gonna be the introduction to the Grisk, uh... Mr. Zahn better make them really interesting, or else it'll be predictable and boring, God. Well, I trust him enough to write a good trilogy, because I've seen him do it. So, you know, let's hope that, that that's gonna just get better from here. Overall, it was a really enjoyable book, and I can't stop thinking about it. The world building is good. Um, the whole, like, dynamic between the politics and the chess military is really cool. Um, the uh, the secret of Scylla and Saplar, as well as the family homestead, as well as the trials, and the scene with the patriarch was some of my favorite bits, as well as throwing with little Cheery, that was the cutest thing ever. In general, like I said, Cheery was one of the highlights of the book, as well as Aralani. Well, you know, at least the women, <laughs> the women are shining in this book, at least. So yeah, this was this was a lot. I I don't even know how to rate this book because Thrawn as a character means so much to me. And anything that I read about him is going to be wildly important to me and to my perception of him and to my own headcanons. You know, because you know, <laughs> in true simp fashion, there's not a day that I don't think about Thrawn and the Chiss and the Chiss Ascendancy. You know, I'm always thinking about some aspect of it and daydreaming. So it's really hard to rate something that is so close to your heart. Mm, but it wasn't my favorite Thrawn book that I've read. I feel like if we were to put canon and legends material into one um, into one uh, list, then I wouldn't rate it above books like Thrawn 2017 or um, Survivor's Quest, or even, I don't know, like, Choices of One, Outbound Flight. Those are really good. I feel like Survivor's Quest and um, Outbound Flight had better intrigue, better character d dynamics, uh, but then again, we're, there was, those were standalone books, as well as Thrawn 2017. That was also, like, supposed to be a standalone book. So, you know... This was, it, it was good. It was not the best, but it was also definitely not the worst. So, can't wait for the next one. I wonder when, when that's going to be announced, because I feel like they're going to wait a few months. Maybe around, like, Thanksgiving or Christmas, they're going to announce that. So, hoping it soon, and hoping that this time we're not going to ha have, like, 57 delays, and then another reschedule and blah, 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 because, you know, we went through two of those. <laughs> That was stressful. So yeah, 
Thrawn Ascendancy book one is done and out in the world. If you still haven't read it or picked it up, first of all, how did you just listen to an hour of me talking about it? <laughs> Spoilers and all. Uh, second of all, do it. I think it's really worth it. I think it's a really good read. Really delves into the world of Chiss Ascendancy and demystifies some of it, which can be good or bad. I feel like a lot of the charm of the Chiss was the fact that they are so mysterious and some of the humanizing um, made them a little bit less cool in some ways, but also not really because I'm still a simp for the Chiss, so <laughs> yeah. So um, that's it. I, I still have... I'm going to have a lot more thoughts about this throughout the coming months, naturally. <laughs> because that's just the way it is with any sort of media that you love. Uh, but that is it for now. I hope you enjoyed my rambly review of this book and me going through my entire live tweet thread, you know, so that I don't forget any important bits. I will see you guys next time and may warriors fortune smile on your efforts!